Good morning. We're so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. As we dive into this musical worship experience, I want to invite you to remember that our God is faithful. He is completely trustworthy. You remember in the days of the Israelites, he showed up as a pillar of fire by night and as a cloud of or as a cloud during the day and they made a promise that they would not go past the clouds they were going to wait on God as they walked because they completely and utterly trusted him now they didn't always trust him let's get honest they messed up and they're like us they made mistake after mistake after mistake but their trust was founded and grounded in the reality that their God our God is faithful so let's stand and let's worship our God, the Lord our God, who is faithful and just and trustworthy. Yeah. 
One church, one faith, one anthem raised. God and God alone. One cross, one grace, one name that saves. All praise to you belong. Sing it to him. All praise to you belong.
It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am.
streets and land set your church Thank you, guys. I wasn't sure if that was my cue or, or what. I was looking for a two-step partner there for a minute. <laughs> I was looking for Patty <laughs> or someone. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, let's open our Bibles this morning to uh, John chapter 9. We are continuing our series on conversations that matter, and they matter because Jesus, in these private conversations, uh, of which there were 11 in John's gospel, uh, offers some, some very unique insights into understanding the nature and the kingdom of, of God that had uh, never really been understood in this way before. And so because they were insightful then, uh, they certainly have to be in, insightful to us today. And so we find ourselves at John's gospel, chapter 9, a very, very familiar story. Uh, we, we all have regrets, don't we? We all think of things where we wish we could get just, just one do-over. I mean, it may be in, in, a, in a mistake we made in a marriage relationship. Maybe we handled a situation law, wrong. We blew up. We got mad. We just wish we could do a do-over. Maybe it's as a, as a parent. You know, you look back over something that, that you wish you could do over in the, in the life of, of your child. Or, or maybe in academics. You, you think about when you could have studied more, when you could have applied yourself more, that you would just love to have just one, one do-over. We're all haunted by something. I tell you, I'm, I'm haunted by, by something that has hung over my head for 35 years. It was my very first sermon. I wish I could have had a do-over. It was, it was the most horrific seven minutes of my life. <laughs> and I would bet that it was probably in the top ten of horrific experiences for those that had to hear it. I mean, it was only seven minutes long. I had planned for it to be 22 minutes long, uh, but it was seven minutes long. And I, I said everything I knew about, about God and theology, I, I got it all in in, in seven minutes. It, it, was, you know, it was absolutely seven minutes of misery. All I wanted to do was to get it over with, and I had, I had committed to doing that for four weeks in a row at this mission church, and all I could think of was, oh, no, i got to do this three more times. It, it was absolutely horrible. I mean, it, it was so bad that, that when we were in the car leaving this little mission, I asked Patty, I said, well, what'd you think? And she said, well, you know, objectively, I think you could have left half of it out. <laughs> That's only seven minutes. But I, I think you could have left seven, um, you know, half of it out. And I said, which half? She said, it wouldn't have mattered which half. <laughs> it, it was that bad. You know, in hindsight, what I realized what I should have done is I, I, I should have just told my story. I, I didn't know enough to say anything else. And what I should have done is just, I should have just got up and told my story. Because, because stories are very powerful. Stories are very compelling. And, and what Christ is doing in, in your life, if you name Jesus as Lord and, and Savior, he, he's writing a narrative in your, your life. He, he's writing a story in your life that, that is very significant. And the story that, that Christ has given to you and that he's writing in you, that, that's your story. But it's a story that, that, that talks about where you come from. Your story of faith and your journey of faith. It's about, it's about where you come from. It's about where you are. It's about, it's about where you're going. It's about your destiny. It's about your, your, your ambitions, your goals in life, what you're wanting to see accomplished. Our story as a people of faith is, is, what, is what binds us together. These stories are all woven together. My story, your story, we're, we're, we're all brought together by these stories, and they're all part of a much greater meta-narrative, big narrative that, that God himself is writing in, in his redemptive history. 
And the reason I like this conversation that took place between Jesus and this blind man, this blind beggar, is that it's a very powerful story. And, and under the most intense cross-examination, this man responds in a way that, that is rich, in a way that is profound, in a way that is dynamic, in a way that grows, like, like stories are supposed to. Stories are supposed to grow. They develop. It's what faith is supposed to do. I want to just pick it up here in verse 1. Where it says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, you're asking all the wrong questions. I'm not going to get caught up in in splitting theological hairs in this conversation of why he was born blind as if somebody did something wrong or if sin was the result of, of this. He says that, you know, you always get caught up. Your questions are always about present tense situations. But, but what God is always doing is much bigger. God's story is much bigger than our present tense. So God, God is doing something else. You're, you're focusing on, on minutia, things that, that really aren't significant in comparison to what, to what God is doing. He says in verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming when, when, no man, when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those previously, who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I I do not know. Of course, the story continues to, to unfold. And we would have to know that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are upset because Jesus has healed once again on on the Sabbath day. He has violated their their interpretation and understanding of of the Sabbath law. And so the religious leaders bring this man in for interrogation, wanting to know who did this and how this all unfolded. And and, and they're trying to find accusation, indictments, uh, indictable charges against Jesus. And so uh, they're getting nowhere with with the man who was healed. And so they bring in his parents. The text says that his parents were, were in fear of the Jews. And so when they asked the, when the religious leaders asked the parents about it, they said, he's of age, he can answer for himself. He's old enough to answer his, his, own, his own questions. And so they, they bring in the man once again, the man that has been healed. And they're trying to to find indictment and accusation against Jesus, and they level the charge that, that Jesus is a sinner. And the man makes this great statement that we do well to hear and to practice. He then answered, this is in verse 25, he said, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know. One thing, one thing I do know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond all accusations, beyond all questions, one thing I do know is that though I was blind, now I see. God has done something significant in the life of this man. He has given him a story, a story that is uniquely his, a story that uniquely expresses his encounter with God through the Son, Jesus Christ. And there are some things here that, that, that we can draw from this experience that have equal application to, 
to our lives, that what happened in this man, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is being accomplished in you. You have the same thing that that man had. There is an intimacy to your story that you cannot take for granted. There is a uniqueness about your experience with Christ that makes it stand apart from anyone else's experience. Every one of us, listen, don't ever discount your story and say, well, you know, my, my testimony's not really that much. You know, it's kind of boring. You know, I didn't have a Damascus Road experience. And nobody here had a Damascus Road experience. But you had an experience. And it's your experience. Which means God has given to you a story that must be told. God has given you a very unique story so that, so that that account might be told to others in the world in which you live. So every one of us have this, this very unique story. And it's this story by which we connect to other people. Remember stories. You think about stories. You may forget sermons, but you never forget stories, do you? Remember at my former church, Patty's closest friend there, she was kind of a, she didn't really listen to sermons real well. At least that was my take on it. Just from watching her from the pulpit, seeing her, she seemed to be looking around a lot, not really paying attention. Well, well, one Sunday she comes up to me after the, the sermon. She says, Bobby, that was a wonderful sermon you preached this morning. I pulled out my wallet and I said, I'll give you 20 bucks if you can tell me one point right now. She stormed off, well, I, I enjoyed it anyway, you know, walked off. You know, you, we forget sermons. We don't forget stories. Stories are how we connect. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2 that you and I, as the people of God, we are an open book known and read by all men. People who will never go to church, people who will never read their Bible, they will read you. They will look at you knowing that you're a, a follower of Jesus Christ and they're going to start making evaluations not so much about you as much as they are the Christian faith. And so you and I have this, this story that, that is very personal. And it's a story that continues to unfold. It's a story that continues to be written. That, that's what stories do. Stories develop. And when we commit our life to Jesus Christ, that, that's just the first line that is being written on a blank canvas of what God desires to see accomplished in your life. There, there's a progression here that you see in the life of the blind man that, that was healed. healed. You see a progression in his, in his faith journey. There's a, there's a growth in contrast to the Pharisees in this story where you actually see a digression of their understanding. But for time restraints, we won't read all, all of these, but let me just make some quick notations here. Noticing the growth and the progression of this blind beggar, notice in, in verse 11, he starts out by referring to the man they call Jesus. Who did this? It's the man they call Jesus. And then he progresses from that, from that description of him. In verse 17, he refers to him as, as a prophet. Then in verse 27, he, he says that this Jesus is, is one worthy of, of being followed. Verse 33, he says that of Jesus, he is one sent from God. And then in verses 35 through 38, he says that he is worthy of worship. You see the progression in his faith journey? It says to us that faith is not some static event that we point to in the past tense. Oh yeah, this is when I committed my life to Jesus Christ. If that was real, if that was genuine, if that has brought about a new birth, there is a progression of understanding. There is a development of faith. At the same time, in the life of these religious leaders, in these Pharisees, what you actually see is a digression of their understanding. In verse 16, they said he's not from God. Verse 18, they're already questioning the miracle, the validity of, of the miracle. In verse 24, they, they even go as far as saying that, that Jesus is, is a sinner. By verse 29, we, we see that they are ignorant themselves of of spiritual things. And then the summation of, of Jesus in, in verse 41 is that they are blind. 
They are spiritually blind and lost in their sin. But see, there, there is a progression, there is a dynamic of faith. And when your story, when your relationship with Christ is something that, that is very personal, listen, it, it cannot be refuted because it's your experience. Now, we're, we're in a day and time when apologetics is, is very popular again. That is, making a defense for the Christian faith. And that's fine and good. All these kind of things go, go in cycles in Christian here, history. They go through periods and, and seasons where apologetics uh, is popular and then it, then it wanes and fades. But, but the downside of apologetics is that we are on a faith journey. I can make some very reasonable, compelling arguments for God, for the existence of God. I can make some very reasonable and compelling arguments for the reason why you should give your life to Jesus Christ. And I can engage in those discussions with someone from, from the academy, someone at a philosophical level. But at the end of the day, I can prove nothing. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God is a faith assertion. It doesn't prove anything. At some point, you have to embrace by faith that God is who he says he is, that God is doing and accomplishing what he is doing and accomplishing through the person of Jesus Christ. That is a faith proposition. And so I can, I can argue, I can defend the faith, I can make arguments that are, that are philosophically consistent. I can make arguments that are compelling. But for every philosophical, academic-type argument I make, there's another philosophical, academic thought that can refute it. But what cannot be refuted is your experience. No one can deny you the intimacy of your story. Because you see, also, as Nathan mentioned before he prayed, we, we, don't just, we don't just have faith for the purpose of having our own personal faith. Faith is something that, that, is, that is to be shared. And the story we share comes out of our personal experience. But there is a primacy to your story. There is, a, there is the primacy of your story in that your story can only be told by you. Jesus said here in verse 4, we collectively, we, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. This is our primary task, telling our story. That's all this man could do. That's what he knew. This one thing I know. I don't know about all these other questions. In fact, two times he says, I don't know. Nothing wrong with saying I don't know. But he says, this one thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. And he has been entrusted with this primary role of telling his story in his world. We find the, the admonition over in the book of Acts. In chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus would say to those disciples gathered before his ascension, he would say, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. You're going to wait. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, which he did on the day of Pentecost. And from that day forward, the church began to multiply exponentially. The church began to grow and to multiply stories of faith began to grow and multiply exponentially to where we are today 2,000 years later with your story and my story. And so our primary task is to go into our world and wherever our feet are, we're telling a story. We're a book, an open book, known and read, as Paul would say, by, by all men. See, that, that's, that's how we accomplish the mission. The mission is not accomplished in here. The most effective place of communicating the gospel, the most effective platform for the story of the gospel being told is not from a pulpit. The most powerful telling of the gospel story doesn't come from me in church. It comes from you outside. 
The proclamation of the gospel, I don't diminish it, it is important. It must be done from pulpits. It has a rich history, 2,000 years, pulpit proclamation of the gospel, the word of God. But the mission of the church is not accomplished in here. The story of the gospel is to be told by you in your world. See, every one of us walk into a world outside this building. Every one of us are, are given a unique personality. Each one of us have a very distinctive life. We have a very different circle of friends. So every one of us, we walk out of this building and we walk into our remotest part of the earth, we walk into our respective worlds. And it's there that we tell the story of the gospel. It's there that the story of the gospel is lived out. It is there where we are the missionary, where our feet are planted. It's not just your story. It's a story that you have been given for the benefit of connecting with others. It is a story that is irrefutable. It is a story of power, which brings me to a final truth. Not just the intimacy of the story, of your story, and the primacy of your story, but the potency of your story. You see, there, there is a potency, there is a power in your story, not, not because of you, actually. As unique and distinctive as, as your story is, as exclusive as your story is, written for you and your heart so that you might be effective in your world, the potency and the power of that story is God's story, the gospel story. Because I know what happens. I know, I know what it's like out there. I engage, I engage the world outside this sanctuary on, on a daily basis. I'm intentional about doing so. But whenever we have opportunity outside of these sanctuaries, whenever we have opportunities to speak of faith, whenever we have opportunities to talk about our story, sometimes in our mind we think, well, this isn't the right time. This isn't the right setting. This isn't the right context. And all that is is fear welling up in us. Because what we fear is that somebody, if I start talking about this, somebody might ask me a question that I can't answer. That's okay. Verse 12, verse 25, God says, I don't know. Nothing wrong with saying I don't know. But we're afraid someone is going to ask us a question that, that we, can't, we can't answer. Or we think that we have, to, we have to say it just the right way. But the story of faith is compelling not because of your intellectual prowess. It's not because you're able to articulate it so well. There is potency in your, in your story because it is the story of the gospel that dwells in you. It is the story of the gospel, the resurrected Christ, that is transforming you. And so, so the story is potent in and of itself. It, it's not the messenger, it's the message. Do we get that? It's not the messenger, it's the message. Therein lies the potency. The late Dr. Fred Craddock, professor of homiletics at Emory University and New Testament, once told the story of a group of fraternity brothers who put together a, a skit. It was some sort of talent show, talent night, and, and this particular group of fraternity brothers decided they were going to do a parody, a parody, a skit of, of evangelical Christianity, which frankly is pretty laughable sometimes, I agree. But, but they were going to do a, a parody, a skit. They were going to have someone that would lead worship songs. They, they had someone that was going to preach a sermon. And they, they had someone that, that, you know, they had fraternity brothers that were going to go up, be out here, and they were going to be the, the, the amen section, the cheering section. Oh, they were making a mockery of the whole thing. You know, they, they were standing and raising their hands while the music was going on, you know, having fun and laughing. And then, and then the guy gets up and actually starts preaching a, a sermon. He starts talking about Jesus crucified, dying on the cross for your sins, 
resurrected, that he's going to come again someday. You better be prepared. They were just making a mockery of the, of the whole thing. They're down here shouting, amen, brother, bring it on, bring it on. As he came to the end of the message, that, that fraternity brother who was pretending to be the pastor even went through the mockery of an invitation. But unbeknownst to them, out in the foyer of that fraternity house was, was a custodian who was sweeping and cleaning, who was captivated by the sermon and this message of a crucified Savior who died for his sins that is coming again and will judge all of mankind. And during that mockery of an invitation, Fred Craddock said that man came down to the altar and gave his life to Jesus Christ. You see, the messenger was mocking, but the message remained. Dr. Roy Fish, who was my professor of evangelism for two classes at Southwestern, Southwestern Theological Seminary back in the, the 1980s. He too is deceased now, but Dr. Fish told us every semester about this one group of students that went out, which he required if you were in his personal evangelism class, you act, actually had to go out and do personal evangelism and then come back and write verbatims about the experience. But every semester he told the story of four young men from his personal evangelism class that went down to a kind of rundown part of, of Fort Worth. It was the red light district just to get to the chase. And this one student, seminary student, was talking to a, a prostitute on a street corner outside a bar. And he had one of those old Billy Graham four spiritual law tracks that, that were popular in that day and time. And that seminary student was there with that four spiritual laws, and he was going through this, this track with this lady, and she was nodding and acknowledging that she understood. And they came to the end of that track, and he said, Ma'am, you, do you feel like this is something that you're prepared to do in your life, to give your life to the Lord Jesus? He said she was watered up. She said, I, I know that's something I need to do, but now is just not the time. She said, do you mind if I keep that track? He said, not at all. She took it, put it in her purse, went into the bar, went to the, to the bar table where she normally sat with a friend, and the friend asked her, Were those, was that one of your tricks out there? She said, no, he's a seminary student. And she said, well, what was he talking to you about? She reached into her purse and pulled out those four spiritual laws and said, well, he was talking about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ and how I could have my sins forgiven and have eternal life and a life of meaning and purpose. And she was walking through that track, explaining each page to her friend. And said her friend began weeping and said, that is exactly what I need in my life. Is he still out there? And they went out together and found him. And that one prostitute led to the Lord by another prostitute. Gave her life to the Savior. You see, it's, it's not you, it's, it's not me. There, there is a potency in the message. You and I have a power of presence. When you are a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, you have a power, a potency of presence. Just by being committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, wherever you're standing, wherever you find yourself at any given moment. A potency that can impact lives in ways that you never imagine on a timetable that you can never imagine. We have a receiver at Texas Tech by the name of Dylan Cantrell. He told me a story last week 
And I think it was a providential story because it, it fit in with this text today. Dylan's dad, his name's Kenny, Kenny Cantrell, successful businessman in, in East Texas in the Tyler area. Kenny grew up in a, in a kind of rough environment, didn't grow up going to church or, or anything like that. Had a sister die when he was 12, 12 years of age. Kenny Cantrell, Dylan Cantrell's father, both of Kenny's parents, his mother and father, died his senior year in high school, six months apart, both of cancer. You imagine what that was like. Both your parents dying in your senior year, six months apart. Because Kenny didn't grow up in church, family didn't grow up, the family never, never went to church. There, there, there was a, a pastor However, Lyndall Watson there in, in White House, he just happened to know Kenny's father. And, and when Kenny's father passed away, Lyndall Watson, the pastor, he stepped in and said, listen, I, I know they don't have a church home, but I know, uh, I know Kenny's father and I'll do, the, I'll do the funeral service. Well, after the funeral, everybody had gone to the home as, as, as they normally do. And, and that was the last place Kenny's dad wanted or Kenny wanted to be. He went outside shooting baskets in the driveway. He didn't want to be around family and friends inside that house. And so he just started shooting baskets. But Lyndall Watson, the pastor, did the service. He pulled up <clears throat> to the house and saw Kenny down in the driveway. And so he walked down to the end of the driveway and just stood under the basket. Ball come through the basket, he'd just throw it back out to Kenny. Pass after pass after pass. Kenny didn't speak. Lyndall didn't speak. The pastor didn't speak. Pass after pass. 15 minutes go by. 30 minutes go by. 45 minutes go by. They haven't spoken a word yet. The last car finally drives off. Without saying a word, Kenny Cantrell drops the ball and walks inside, never says a word. Imagine what that kid was going through. A year later, he marries his high school sweetheart. A year after that, their first child is born. His wife says, I grew up going to church. We're going to start going to church. We're going to raise our kids in church. Kenny Cantrell, who had never gone to church. Only pastor he knew was this guy two years ago that stood, in a bas stood under a basket and threw him the ball for an hour. Kenny made the statement, well, if we're going to go to church, we're going to go to that church where that guy pastors that threw me the basketball. He would lead Kenny to Christ. He would become his mentor he would become a father figure to him. Didn't preach at him. Didn't start quoting Bible verses at him. There was just a potency, a power in his presence. Kenny never forgot it. I'm saying to you, you have a story. You have a unique story. And it's a story that has been given to you to tell. Because there is a power that is in you. There is a potency that is in you that can shape and influence the lives of people. The only one that can tell your story is you. No one else. Tell your story. Tell what you know blind but now I see father how grateful we are for the stories that you give to us for the testimonies of faith that are exclusively ours that are unique to our story to our experience to the world in which we live we know that our story must be biographical it is a story that must be shared so, Father, I pray that even as we open this altar this morning, 
I pray for those first that, that have never given their life to you, whose lives right now are but a blank canvas waiting to be written. And that with a simple childlike faith, they would come to a place of faith and commitment to you. Not, not having all the answers, having no idea what, what lies in wait, but by faith, stepping forward, writing the first line of the story that you desire to write in them. For others, Lord, that would desire to come and join us on this journey, to be a part of a, of a community of faith, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit might impress upon them the significance and the meaningfulness of what it is to be a part of a church family that faith is never lived in isolation, but always in community. And so we give this time to you and to your writing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For more information, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. Check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15 or 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Download our mobile app to experience even more from First Lubbock. Thanks for watching. God bless and have a great week.